God the consuming fire and hell fire. There is probably more mythology taught to children on these subjects, on and about it. For example, one of the first things a child learns in Sunday school is the guy with the long red-handled underwear, the pitchfork, and two horns. Okay? That's not biblical. You're not going to find it anywhere in God's Word. Okay? I assure you, Satan, as he is described in Ezekiel chapter 28, was the most beautiful of the archangels, the cherubims, I more correctly said. So if you were looking for what is commonly taught, you would be sadly mistaken. And is there a burning hell right now? Does the Bible declare there is a burning hell in existence today? The answer, absolutely not. It shows the inadequacy of people to understand parables taught by Christ because usually the burning hell is picture is picked up from uh, Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Well, that's a parable, and much of it is yet future. And you must understand what burns really hotter uh, spiritually than anything is embarrassment, to know you're wrong. How many of you have ever just really been embarrassed out of your socks, you know? Yeah, me too, you know? Boy, your face turns red, you're, you are bombed. I mean, embarrassed to the high heavens. Well, amplify that considerably to face God and realize you didn't make it. There he is in all his splendor and all he's done for us, and you have to turn up a failure. That, that hurts, and that's sad. But as far as a burning hell today, there is none. And is there going to be? Oh, there's going to be a lake of fire. But until God is always fair, and it's, if, you, if you get confused when people commence with mythology, know this, God is always fair, and he's not going to throw anyone into the pit until after the judgment. You know, have you ever heard of someone executed before they even had a trial? I mean, recently, <laughs> in the old days, that was customary sometimes. It's called a lynching mob. But um, it, it, today, God's not going to do that. There will be no one cast into the lake of fire, call that hell if you want to, until after the great white throne judgment. And when does that happen? At the end of the millennium. At the end of the Lord's day. Well, does that lake of fire exist today? Not in our dimension, it doesn't, certainly. Because it will be spiritual bodies that will go into that lake of fire, not flesh bodies. Meaning, at the beginning of the millennium, all are changed into spiritual bodies. So you see, we've got a great deal to work with here. God is always fair. Okay. And you're going to get what you got coming to you. That's true enough. But it's well established in our Father's Word. Now, the first subject we're going to take is God the consuming fire. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is symbolized by fire? How does it make you feel? Wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. Well, that's God's fire touching you. Now, when it touches the wicked, how do you think it feels to them? Not so hot, or not so good, I should say, okay? Embarrassing, and minus God's blessings. Now, many teach that well, Satan, you know, they'll even teach their little children, Satan's going to throw you into hell, into the lake of fire. No, Satan has no authority whatsoever. Satan directly has no say whatsoever about who goes where. Do you want me to say that again? Satan is finished. Satan has absolutely no authority to say where anyone is going because he himself is the least of all inasmuch as he's already sentenced to death in the lake of fire. Ezekiel 28, 18, and 19. So uh, don't, don't be afraid of the devil. God gave you power over him, and I hope you're enough of a Christian to stand up and say, Buddy, you mess with me. You're messing with trouble. All right. And that's the attitude you should have. You should know how to take names and kick dragon. All right. 
because he gave you that power and that authority. The question is, do you use it? So, God, the consuming fire, you know, he has used that fire in so many ways to show his love for the children. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. What did old Moses see up on the mountain? Verse 2 of Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And it reads, And the angel of the Lord, that means the Lord's presence, appeared unto him in a flame of fire. That's the flame of Yah, if you would. Out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Symbolic of the tree of life. The same flaming swords that were placed around it to protect it in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis chapter 3. In a very special Hebrew word that is only used in two places in the manuscripts. That's to say in the great Songs of Solomon, which we just completed. As well as the very last verse of the third chapter where the fire, it's a special fire. It is the fire, flame of Yah. God's flame. Well, that's what we're seeing here. Now, if God loves you, do you think his fire is going to hurt you? Of course not. Boy, would he be a failure if that were to be the case. But he loves you. All his flame is going to do is warm you. And you need to get that settled in your mind real good. Or you'll end up fearing God rather than revering him. And Moses said in verse 3, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. I mean, there it is, it's not hurting it at all. You might remember there was another time that three individuals, I mean, were, were um, exposed to man's fire. That is to say, in the great book of Daniel, they heated the oven seven times what was necessary and threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar said, how many men did we throw in there? And they said three. He said, well, I see four walking, and one is like the Son of God. That's in uh, Daniel chapter 3. For, for just make a side note, we're not going to go there. They came out and what? Nebuchadnezzar called them for. They weren't even singed. You couldn't even smell smoke on their clothes. Because God is able to take care of his own. That's why you must learn to love him. That his fire warms you, blesses you. And he is a consuming fire. We'll talk about that word consuming in the Greek before we finish this lecture. Verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Five. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Don't you come close here now. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Naturally, there was a saying, you could not see the face of God without dying. And the actual matter of the fact is, God's in a different dimension than we are spiritual. And you cannot see that dimension unless you are in the transition of death. That's why... People on their deathbeds see relatives that have passed on. It's a different dimension. Don't, don't, don't let that become some weird thing, all right? Just put it on the shelf if you don't see through it clearly and let it lie. But there our father appeared to Moses. Naturally, why? To instruct him. Instruct him because of Moses? No, because of his children. That's the same way he will utilize you is not necessarily for your own personal benefit, but for God's children. If you are one of God's elect, you were already chosen before the foundations of the world, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And he can utilize you without, without having to mess up your opportunity on judgment day. Why? As it is written in Romans chapter 8, you're already justified or judged. That doesn't mean that 
if you sin, you're not going to get the paddle, okay? And, uh, and sometimes a little harder than someone that had cho- freedom of choice might have. Turn on with me, if you will, to the 14th chapter. I want to see this fire used in a little different way here. The fire of God, his warmth, his blessings, the Holy Spirit that comes near you. Chapter 14 of Exodus, verse 19. I want you to know that when the children were escaping and there was great danger, God stood between. And to show you that he can cause his fire to be whatever he shall so choose, listen to this, verse 19. And the angel of God, or the presence of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Why? The Egyptians were behind them. It's setting up a parameter, verse 20. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was, I repeat, it was a cloud of darkness to them. They didn't see the light. They didn't see the fiery pillar. All it was to them was darkness, scary. But it gave light by night to these, that is to say the children, so that the one came not near the other all the night. In other words, God protected them. God takes care of his own, his fire. What what do I want you to derive from this? If God loves you, he's not going to burn you, all right? He's not going to hurt you. He's not looking for someone to zap. He drew a border between them and used the same source to protect and to hold away. Our Father is able. You know, that applies to your life even to this day. When you truly try to serve Him, God surrounds you. You're, you are impregnable. No, they, they can't bother you as long as you use common sense. You go to, te- you know, some people will say, well, God will protect me. I'm going to go down and have him part Spavanaugh for me. <laughs> well, God can't use people like that, you know. That was the same way Satan was trying to get Christ. Hey, jump off of that building. What, what, kind, of, what kind of nonsense would have it have been for Christ to climb up on a high building and jump off? You know, that's kind of, whoa. You know, he's smarter than that. What am I saying? You be smarter than that. Satan will try everything in the world to con weak people. Don't be weak. Okay, I'm speaking spiritually. Okay? You know, some of, some of the most handicapped people in the world have such strong spirits that they, uh, they are impregnable. Our Father takes care of His own. His fire is not going to get you. His fire is not going to burn you. And again, never, never use Satan as an excuse to frighten children. Why? He has no authority. He doesn't get to say boo about anything. Well, can his spirit try to deceive? Of course it can. Turn on with me to the 24th chapter of the same book of Exodus. Let's look at this in a little different light. I'm only going to read... Chapter 24, book of Exodus, verse 17. Uh, Well, let's go with 16. And the glory of the Lord, there again the presence of the Lord, abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire. Now, do you know what devouring fire is? It's consuming fire. It consumes all they're in. Well, that sounds a little scary. Well, what have you done? Again, you want to analyze yourself. If you're afraid of God, you better analyze what did you do to be afraid of Him? He's he's not going to hurt you if you love Him. He has no reason to hurt you. But to captivate you and devour you with His loving Spirit is a wonderful thing to happen. It's bliss. It's something... Few people get to experience and really realize what's happening. To be captivated by him, totally engulfed. 
is a beautiful thing. The presence of God. Okay, a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Naturally, there were many of them very frightened. As a matter of fact, they asked Moses in a sense, don't bring us back here anymore. We, we, we don't want any part of it. But knowing and trusting your father is an important thing. He is a consuming fire, and you better look forward to the time that he engulfs you into his love, his arms, his spirit, because that's what we all work forward to. And if you trust him and know him, you look forward to that rather than to fear. This is why that one Hebrew word that is translated fear more often than it is revere has the same meaning in the Hebrew tongue, reverence. Reverence and fear is the same word in the Hebrew tongue. And unfortunately, it's most often translated fear because of the misinformation or understanding of those that look toward God as a consuming fire. Why, are we on a guilt trip? Have you been that bad? I don't think so. He loves you. He wants to captivate you into the family whereby you feel the warmth of a fire that knocks off the chill of the night and the world as you walk through it and brings blessings and love, protection, and understanding. So, yes, God is a consuming fire, but... Um, in a good sense for those that are corrected and, and it can't even be a bad sense for those that would harm his children. Well, isn't, and there's nothing unnatural about that. What do you do to protect your children? You go to great ends. You plan. And if you don't have children, what do you do to protect your kin? You're going to worry about it and make sure they're in a safe place, as safe as can be. And if you see them doing something dangerous, you're going to correct them. Well, do you think God is any less than you are? He's going to take care of his own as best he can, or let me rephrase it, as best people will allow him to protect them. And the whole thing slides along in what the... the um, Lubrication that keeps it going is faith and belief in him. To know he's fair, he's honest, he's just, and he's loving. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with the Father. Let's go to the New Testament, the great book of Luke. Let's go. What, what, about, what did Christ have to say about these things? He was born a babe. Little baby Jesus came to save the world. That's true. But... What methods did he utilize to bring about that salvation? All right. Luke chapter 12. Let's go with verse uh, 49. And verse 49 reads, this is the teachings of Jesus Christ. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? What is that fire again? Well, we've been talking about it. It's a fire that protects, that warms, that loves, that blesses. And at the same time, it cuts no slack for Satan. Okay? Now, you've got to be a real Christian to stand up and belt out the fire of God. Because, I mean, what is a minister supposed to really be? I don't know. Have you ever, have you ever read... Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, what is it, along about verse 7, which relates and quotes from the Old Testament, Psalms 104, verse what, about 4? Ministers of fire. God's ministers of fire. I'll never forget the documentary we did in Loudoun County, Tennessee, where never before had the stone been properly translated until... You're, we were able to see it, analyze it, and there it should have been translated because it was perfect Palo Hebrew. It said, may the lion of the tribe of Judah 
be the voice and the voice of God be the poker that draws these firebrands. They were priests from the fire. So God expects His ministers to be a little fiery. You know. Now some people might like to go to a church sometime where, well, you all look well today. I hope that you have found happiness. And maybe I will read a verse from God's word after a while, but for the moment, just enjoy my speech. Okay. Well, now, I, I like to hear the word, because it is fire. And it's going to stir up. It's going to cause division. But, well, I don't know if I want to be involved in causing division. Do you love Satan? You don't want to divide the helpless children away out of his camp, his grasp, then you're no good. You've got to want to cause division between God and Satan for his children. That's why he sent you. That doesn't mean you're going to be a troublemaker, okay? Because if you do it intelligently and with tact, but yet with the sharp sword of the word it divides all right it divides the good from the bad and lets the person know it is truth how can anyone learn the truth if they're not taught it how can anyone see the good if they're not warned of the bad Christ came to bring a fire what would the fire do uh, what, what does it mean here if I, I'm so happy if I find it kindled He's happy with you if you're exercising the firebrands a little bit, okay? The word, the truth, to be more specific. Verse 50, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straighted how, I, till it be accomplished? You know, he said, I'm pained until I get it done. Why? It paved the way for salvation on repentance, beloved. He wanted to make that way open that shows pure true love 51 suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth you think I've come down here to make a covenant with Satan I tell you nay but rather division for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided three against two and two against three and it will if you're in a family that all can see the truth. You are so blessed. You truly are. Because I tell you this, some families can get in regular knock-down drag-outs over religion. Now, a wise person doesn't talk religion in a family when he sees that those three are not going to hear until God touches them. You can't. So just, they're your relatives. Love them. But don't argue God's word with them. They can't stand the heat of the loving fire. Okay? So, you see, Jesus has a little different message sometimes than some who just want to be a soothsayer and make people feel good now. Well, really to make people feel good, you teach them the truth. And it makes you feel good from your big toe to the top of your head or your little toe, which is first. I guess my big toe sticks out further. Anyway, what all over your body, you're going to feel good about our Father's Word, and that's great. It causes a division that puts you on one side of the gulf or the other. And that gulf is a very serious thing according to the teachings of Christ in Luke 16 because one side of it didn't make it. The other side did. So you want to make sure that in the division you're on the right side. Well, how, how, how can I tell? The Word of God. It is written. Have you read it? Okay. Go, let's go on to 1 Corinthians here as we're moving on through here. 1 Corinthians. How does God test people? How, do, how does he judge people today as to what they're doing, whether it's effective, whether um, he can count on them? 
and how does it work out in the ministry as to who's doing what, okay? And how does God judge that when he gets ready to test it by fire? Because that's how it's tested. He uses that analogy so that you can see into the spirit judgment with a little clearer understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, and it reads, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, and certainly Paul was, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth up thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. In other words, you be real careful when you put something on the foundation of the Word of God. If God gives you an unction or a feeling, you better be right, okay? You better check it out. Well, what was that foundation? Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's to say His teachings. He that came to bring fire of division, not peace, not making peace with Satan or a contract, but dividing and separating those that would love God from those that would love Satan. Verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, now, now stop and think just a moment. If God is a consuming fire, and he tests things by fire. How does gold compare to stubble? Whoa. Stubble doesn't amount to much, just a whoop, And it's gone. What happens when silver or gold, that's, that's to say, and this doesn't have anything to do with monies, beloved. This has to do with deeds of some brother that was really down or sister. and You, you smiled and said, God loves you. He'll help you. That's gold. Okay. That's a wonderful deed, is to stand by someone. And there are ever so many more. But what happens when gold is exposed to fire? It just gets better and better. Okay. It may be 99, 99% pure, but you put some more heat to it, and it may even be pure. It doesn't hurt it. It always makes it better. Okay, but naturally, if you get around to studying God's Word, well, I guess I ought to. You know, I'm, I'd rather be shooting around a goof, or golf rather, than something, you know. But here I am with the Word. Well, let's get to it. That's hay, friend. Just plain old pure hay. And I tell you, when the heat hits it, whew, it's in bad shape. One verse revolving revs are in trouble, all right? I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm judging anybody, okay? I, I just, when I read that particular verse, it, it um, well, you know, you just want to make sure you improve your works a little bit, right? Verse 13, every man's work, every man's faith, uh -uh. every man's work shall be made manifest. That means made known. It's in the book, friend. He keeps records. God does. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's to say what he put upon the foundation, which is to say what he put upon Jesus Christ. 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he'll receive a reward. And on Judgment Day, rather than being penalized or punished, it's reward time, friend, payday, okay? 15, if any man's work shall be burned, uh-oh, he shall suffer loss. But listen carefully, I want you to see the love of God. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Now, I'm going to tell you what. Some might say, well, that's all I care about is just making it. <laughs> well, do you know what your work is? Your righteous acts, which is the goal? That weaves the fine linen that you wear in heaven so that you're dressed. Otherwise, if you just sneak through the door, guess what you're going to look like? Nakeder than a baby 
uh, bird before God in heaven. Whew! Now you talk about fire and embarrassment. And you know something? That's biblical, friend. That is absolutely down to this earth biblical. Do you want to know where it's written? I'll tell you if you want me to. It's written in Revelation chapter 19, verses 8 and oh, 7 through 9, where he talks about those that are clothed. And then you can read Revelation chapter 3, and he'll tell you about how naked you are if you don't have any righteous acts, which weaves the linen that you wear in heaven. Okay? So, <clears throat> don't ever have a desire to just make it. You know, not, not when it comes to serving your father. He wants to be proud of you. He wants to know he can count on you. That way he can use you more and more with confidence that you know how with the fire to bring division that will pull people from the fire of Satan's evilness into the camp of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God, our Heavenly Father, is a spiritual fire. And it is one that warms, that protects, and even that saves, in this case, will bring you that salvation. Okay, let's go to the great book of Hebrews, and let's get down to where this really, what does this mean to you today? This 12th chapter, we're going to go to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. This 12th chapter of Hebrews has to do with whether or not you're ready to run the race in the final generation. And he clarifies, he said, hey, don't ever kid yourself. I'm going to tear this world a system, not the terra firma, a rets in the Hebrew tongue. I'm going to give her a shaking. And do you know what glues you down, friend? It's good works. All right? It's loving him, faith. And in serving him and being engulfed in, or captivated by his spirit or his flame. Um, so um, let, let's pick it up in verse 20. We'll spend a little bit of time here, okay? He's, he's going to tell you about how he's going to shake this up and maybe you'll decide where you want to be. Verse 20 of chapter 12. For they could not endure that which was commanded and if such... So, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight. We're back all the way back to Sinai. You got that? This is where we started, Exodus chapter 3. That sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Okay. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the Heavenly, I repeat, the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. A lot of people's going to make it, your grandparents that love the Lord and so forth. He's getting an army ready in heaven also, beloved. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. It's in the book. And to God, the judge of all, that's why you don't ever want to be caught judging. Discernment, fine. Judgment, no. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. This word perfect would better translate mature. That you think maturely in the word. All right? The word just, of course, is the equivalent of the Hebrew Zadok of Ezekiel chapter 44, meaning God's election. Verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. In other words, it was more noble. Well, what blood was sprinkled? Christ's blood on the cross. Okay. The new covenant. The new contract. Repent and be forgiven. 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, if they didn't obey Moses... Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. That is to say, Christ in this generation especially. When they didn't listen to Moses, what happened? Well, there was a lot of things happened, 
okay? Let's even go back to Abraham. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone fell upon. Well, how could it rain fire? Well, you figure it out. You got, let's see, what does it take to make fire? Fuel, oxygen, and ignition. Well, God shows us his igniter quite often. It's followed by thunder, okay? He can work about however he wants to work with the elements, and you better be well to understand it. In other words, when you don't listen, he has a way of correcting, all right? 26. But that, that's minor and minute compared to what he's about to explain. 26. Whose voice then shook the earth. That's the first overthrow, the katabo. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. I'm going to boot Satan out just before I shake it up and get my army together. And we're coming down and we're cleaning house. Okay? And, of course, that's the second advent. Verse 27. And this word. What word is that? God's word. This word, yet once more, signifieth, declares, gives you a sign. The removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that's to say created, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I don't know. Where's your house built, friend? Is it on the sand? Or are you solid? Do you shake in your boots every night? Do you see a picture of a, a man in red long handle underwear with a pitchfork and horns? All right? I hope not. I hope you're more intelligent than that. I hope that you know who your enemy is and that you're able to be a soldier that is able to carry forth the Word of God and to stand against the opposition that will come against you in the end times. Hey, God's going to shake her out, friend. You might say, well, I've been wondering when those old boys that look like they always do bad get what they got coming to. They're going to, all right? You've got to be on solid ground. You know what? Do you know how God's going to do that in part? Do you know how it starts? By casting Satan from heaven to the earth as the false messiah. And the whole world that isn't on solid ground is going to whore after him. And you know many people that will, without a doubt, when he comes in, I've come to rapture you all out of here. <laughs> yep. Get on my wagon, little darlings. I love you. Here, let me pay off all your bills. How many will that swing into his camp? You mean really? I mean really. That's what he will say, of course. Where is that written in the Bible? Daniel, book of Daniel, the overlay of Revelation. He comes in prosperously and peacefully, okay? Big Daddy claiming to be Jesus. And you better make your stand. You better get ready. Well, when were we warned of this? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, plus most of the Old Testament that the bastard shepherd would come first. Do you know what that means? The illegitimate one. Mark 13. There are two messiahs. There are two tribulations written of there. And a child can read it throwing out all the traditions of men. And understand that the false Christ comes first. And many are going to deceive, be deceived. But what are you to do? Not premeditate what you will say, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. At that moment, and you have nothing to fear because God is in control and God is a consuming fire. Okay, just keep on solid ground and you can't have a better foundation than the Word of God. You got that? The Word of God will carry you through. God's not going to pay, play any tricks on you. Don't listen to this man or any other man without checking him out in the word itself. Okay, um, verse 28. Wherefore, we, rece we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. That's to say godly reverence, even if you would. 
29, listen carefully. For our God is a consuming fire. This word uh, consuming in the Greek is kataanelisko. Oh, what does that mean? I got some good news and I got some bad news. It's according to which side of the line you're on. It means to utterly, severely, completely uh, consume. If you're bad, that means you're blotted out. There's nothing left. He, ha he has that ability. You understand the lock and the key to the key to the knowledge is in the word consume, okay? But if he loves you, it means that you are all encompassed with his love, his light, because you're on a solid foundation. God indeed is a consuming fire. God is our father. Do you know that? He's your father, and he's that great. That gives you something to really be proud of and to... And to uh, rely on, to think on. Okay, again, what does God expect his ministers to be? I quoted it earlier. Psalms 104, verse 4. Ministers of fire. Okay, that cleanse. You know, do you know, um, the most, one of the most cleansing things, I'll use this as an analogy and perhaps some will think this is a digression, if you happen to be out in the desert far away from where there's any medicines or anything else and you receive a, a pretty bad cut, for many, many, many hundreds and hundreds of years, what do we do with that cut before a man bleed to death? We're going to put it to what? The fire. We're going to cauterize it. And it'll be well. It'll be good. So. Carterize your own heart towards Satan. That means seal it over to where there's no feeling there. Have, have you ever had a real bad burn that you don't, you don't have any, your nerves are shot there, okay? Some of your nerves are shot anyway. But, well, sometimes it could be, okay? But you receive, um, where you receive a wound, an old war wound or something like that, there's not much feeling there. Well, see that you're cauterized against Satan. I think I have a lecture on that even, be that as it may. But 104, ministers of fire that even sometimes cause division. It is not meant that you are to be liked by everyone because that would mean that you were liked by Satan also. You'd be in a heap of hurt, friend. It's important that you be liked by those that love the Lord. Now, Let's talk about hellfire. The word hell, well, let's take the Old Testament first. In the Old Testament, the word most often used for hell is shul. In the Hebrew tongue. And not one place does it mean or can it be translated into a burning place. All the word means in the Hebrew tongue is a place of the dead, all right? Now, it is translated in your King James, the word shill. 54% of the time, it's translated grave, okay? And 5% um, of the time, it's translated pit. And 41% of the time, it's translated as hell. I, is the grave hell? Not really, because that's not where people are in the first place. Why? To be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Instantly, just like that. Documentation? Yeah, well, we'll there's several places. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Instantly, when this old body dies, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul, returns instantly to Almighty God who gave it. That's where you came from. You go back home, all right? So the grave is the grave. It's the place where we put these remains, the flesh, and it doesn't ever know anything again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 declares that, and it shakes a lot of people up. 
Because they don't realize we've got a far better body than this flesh one, though there's nothing wrong with it. Other than it kind of talks to you at times, doesn't it? I mean, your flesh body. They'll say, boy, I wish he'd hurry up and get through. I've just sat in this old chair so long and it's beginning to bring pressure here, you know. I mean, your body has a way of talking to you when you're doing God's business even. So, but when you're through with, or your stomach, I wish you'd hurry up. We got beans on at home. It's, you know, it, it'll, it'll argue with you. Tell it to be still. You know. Anyway, when you're through with it, you put it aside and you have a far greater thing that God has made the flesh in the image of. When he said, let us make man in our image, you go back to that body and you're like free. Okay, So, the grave doesn't hold people. And I think it's wrong to translate it as hell, quite frankly, because it's not hell. It's a grave, period. Sometimes supplica is, is called uh, the grave. Now, in the Greek, that, that takes care of the Hebrew, all right? I'm telling you in the Hebrew, when hell is used, all it is is a grave. Check me out. If you have a strong concordance, it's real easy to do. You're not going to find a burning pit. All right, it's not there, period. Now, let's go to the New Testament. And let's take, um, we have two words. There are actually three. I'm only going to mention two because the third one is simply a holding place for, for fallen angels. And that doesn't, none of you are fallen angels, I hope, <laughs> anyway. And uh, uh, so we won't, I'm not even going to mention it because it doesn't have anything to do with you. You'll find it in Second Peter if you want to check it out for yourself. Anyway, Hades and... Gehenna. Now, Hades is a Greek word that, guess what it means? A place for the departed, the dead. Okay, that's where you put them. Dig a hole, put them in it, whatever. Cremation, whichever choice, that's it. Okay, period. Now, Gehenna is a little bit different because it, it means in the valley of Hinnon. Okay. Hinnon was a place where old Moloch, he really liked it there. Do you know what Moloch practice is? Moloch practice is burn them babies. Burn them little girls. Burn them people. Okay? They burn people. Okay? We'll, we'll go, we're going to read about that in just a minute because we're talking now. I've switched from God the consuming fire to hell far. Okay? All of you know what hell far is. I hope. We're going to find out if you don't, all right? So, but what was in the valley of Gehenna that Jesus would refer to it so often? The maggots, the worms go in and the worms go out. It's the garbage pit in the valley of Hinnon and outside the city of Jerusalem. And it burned and smoked and smoldered night and day. It is the geographical location of judgment. Okay, I want to make that clear. But Christ used it as an analogy so people could see what it would be like. You know where animals would die and they'd throw them on that garbage hump and bump and old decaying food. And he said, you old decaying people that won't listen to me, that's where you're going to be like. Okay, you know, that gets the message. He was a good teacher. Okay, so that was Gehenna, but actually what it was to be out and out, it's not hell. But you look, check where word hell is used. Go to the Greek, Gehenna. Okay. It's, not, it's not hell. It's Gehenna, right outside of Jerusalem. So at this moment, there is no blasting furnace or hell until after judgment. Then there will be indeed a, a lake of fire. Now, having said that, let's go to some scripture just a moment. And let's talk about Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm going to take you through this rather quickly. Well, not too quickly. I want you to get the message. 32, 32nd chapter of Jeremiah. And we want to pick it up in verse 32. I want you to understand Gehenna, Moloch, okay? What did God think about burning babies? That's what I want to bring to your mind. Everybody's so anxious to see God throw somebody in the pit. Okay? Or, you know, what I mean, they teach that, the traditions. Honey, you better be good or God will send you to hell. You'll burn like a piece of bacon. 
Okay, chapter 32, Jeremiah, verse 32, because of all the evil of the children of Israel, this is your father speaking, and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, the whole bunch, and their prophets and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the whole hit and caboodle of them. They've just done me wrong. Verse 33, God speaking. And they have turned into me, unto me the back. That's an insult. You realize that, don't you? That's an insult to God. And not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. They just won't listen to common sense. What do they do instead? Verse 34, but they set their abominations in the house, my house even, which is called by my name to defile it. They bring that trash and false teachings into my sanctuary. 35, and they built the high place of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnon. This is Gehenna. To cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. What was God's commandment? Don't do it. You don't burn people. Neither came it into my mind. I didn't even think of such a hideous thing of offering human sacrifice that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. I just want you to know when Jesus refers to Gehenna and what God said about Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnon, same thing. Translated from Greek to Hebrew to Hebrew to Greek, okay? When, when we're utilizing it in this way. It's no wonder that Jesus would use that. So, right away then, the place which is most often, turned. let's just get this out of the way, Luke chapter 16. This is what causes most people to teach today and frighten people with this so-called burn and hail. Oh, it's bad. This is a parable about two actual people that existed on this earth, the rich man and Lazarus. They were real people. But Jesus utilized them to teach an analogy into the dimension of heaven and what's happening there whereby we in these flesh bodies could get a little better view. Okay, let's pick it up with verse 19. Let's go with it. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared scrumptiously every day. He had it made. Money, money, plenty of this. Car in all of his garages and so forth. 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. In other words, they had to carry him there, and that's where they kept beggars, okay? 21, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. He was in a bad way, okay? 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now this word buried here means it was a great funeral service. Oh, we're going to put him away good. Let's get him a really expensive casket, buy lots of flowers, and preach him a sermon that that people will be peeking in the box to see if we got the right man in there, okay? A scrumptious funeral, okay? Verse 23, and in hell, there's that word, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Do you know what that word torments is? Embarrassed. I mean, uh, basanos. It means just really flushed. It doesn't mean torment like from pain, okay, of, of being. In the, in the first place, he's not in the flesh anymore. You couldn't feel fire in the spirit body if you tried. Okay, well, what a statement. <laughs> Be that as it may. It'll get the job done, I guess. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, I want you to mark this. Jesus is painting a picture here that we've got hell in the sight of Abraham at the throne, right? I mean, they can see and they can communicate. I want you to mark one thing in your mind. He ain't in no hole in the ground, okay? 
They might have gave him the best funeral going, but he's not there anymore. Because to be absent from the flesh body is to be present with the Lord. And Jesus is going to tell you how that all works out here in just a minute. Okay, As it's obvious, the poor man, or Lazarus, is doing pretty good. Incidentally, Lazarus being converted from Greek back to the Hebrew as Eleazar, which was the correct priesthood, rather than the two old boys that played with strange fire. I want to say that again. Lazarus is the Greek word for Eleazar in the Hebrew tongue, which was the son of Aaron that didn't play with strange fire because God killed the two that did. So we're seeing the true priesthood resurrected here by the words of Christ. Is what I'm, is the point I want you to make from it of real truth teaching. All right? Now, having said that, uh, I'll get 25 again. And Abraham and said, Son, remember that thou in thy... Well, wait, wait, 24. And he cried and he said... Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, naturally, it was a flame, not like you consider fire today. And what was the water he wanted his finger dipped in? The living word, the truth, that he wouldn't be in the fix he's in now if he had listened to it. Give me another chance, that's what he's saying, okay? Verse 25, And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime, flesh, receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This, again, this, I, w I want you to check this word tormented out in your Strong's Concordance. It's odinako, oh, and it means to grieve. Just simply to grieve. It doesn't mean pain like, oh, God, it's licking at my feet. Uh, you know, not, not, just grieve. Grieve for what? He didn't make it. Looks over there and see the Lord Jesus, Almighty God on his throne and his grandparents and everyone that did make it. And here he's standing off over here where he can see it. And he's hurting bad. 26, and beside all this, between us, Jesus speaking, between us and you, between where we are and where you are, sinner, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither come, can they pass to us that would come from thence. In other words, in the time of holding, I'll call it, until judgment, except for what shall happen on the Lord's day. And there will be teaching on the Lord's day because there are some people that didn't have an opportunity because of what they'd been taught. They're going to be taught. And, and they're going to, some will understand, some won't. He said, there's a gulf in between. And after death, there's nothing you can do about overcoming. This is why it's all right if you want to pray for the dead. But for the time being, it's locked in. You better hope you can help them in the millennium, if anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's locked. There's a gulf there. It's fixed. They're there. You're here. And nobody can cross. It's set. Okay? Uh, 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now here he's getting a little compassion. He's saying, if you can't help me, he's thinking about his brethren. Now, 28. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into uh, this place of torment. Uh, Basanos, uh, this place of grief. You know, it kind of even means touchstone. And I did a, a, a study on that one time. 29. You better watch the touchstone. You better touch the right stone. Our rock is not their rock. 29, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They got the written word. They got the Bible. Let them read it. 13, he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. 31, and he said unto him, 
if they bear not Mo, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And of course, it wouldn't be long hence that Christ would. He would rise from the dead. I don't know. Do they accept him today? Not everyone. It just doesn't happen. That's why you must be a minister of fire, which means truth. For your father is a consuming fire. Now, there, this man was not tormented with an actual blaze, but that's, this is why that people uh, not learned in, um, in um, analogies and parables of Christ. That's why Jesus would say, if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you're not going to understand any of my parables. Well, if you didn't understand the parable of the sowers, what happens to the tares at the end of the millennium? They are reaped in bundles and cast where? Into the fire. That's when there will be a fire. It's called the lake of fire. But it's not a fire like you might uh, uh, think of today because God is a consuming fire. He can consume souls. And that's what it's all about, quite frankly. Now, to document that, turn with me in the book of Matthew to chapter 10 real quickly. Matthew chapter 10, I'm going to read one verse. I'm going to be a one verse Charlie here in Matthew 10. Just going to cover one verse for you. Matthew 10 verse 28, and it reads, And fear not, I want to repeat, fear not them which kill the body. That means your flesh body. But are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That is to say to cause it to perish. It means into the lake of fire. Okay. Who is that? That's your father almighty God. He can blot out a soul. Just bam. Just like that. Well, you, mean, you mean hell's forever and ever? You bet it is. It's very final. Once you go in there, that's it. The soul is dead. It's called the second death. But, and and you, you will have some Christians that are so ignorant. And here it sounds like I'm judging. I'm not. I mean, what kind of heaven do you want? Um, and I had a, a friend that belongs to the denomination here in town. Bless his heart, he is passed on at this time. So I shouldn't mention his name because he knows real well by now. But is that if I didn't believe, here I've been good and attended that church right down there all my life, I've had to sit there. And if I didn't believe they was going to burn up in hell, I'd have been out doing something different. And I said, well, you served the Lord for the wrong reason, friend. You know? But, I mean, now that's really kind of ignorant, isn't it? And bless his heart, I loved him to pieces. And I, if he happens to be listening spiritually, I want him to know that because I don't want him mad at me. But <laughs> I'm, I'm jesting, okay? But um, uh, actually, they paint a picture of here's the throne of God. We're in heaven. We're in the eternity. Everything is so wonderful. And just as it stated there in Luke 16, right here inside of the throne, I mean, there's the god awfulest fire you ever saw burning in your life. And there's all your kinfolks out there in it, just a bobbling like bacon frying in the fat. Oh, help me. You know, a little scream here and there. And that's heaven? I don't quite see that picture as heaven, okay? That would be very cruel, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you be disappointed in your father God if he lit a match to them and just let them burn forever and scream and holler and you had to listen to it? Would that be heavenly to you? It wouldn't to me. Okay, I don't like to see people suffer. It really, it bothers me. So naturally, what God meant was, I can kill souls. That's why you better listen to me and pay attention. Because when I blot you out, you're gone. You, it's as though you never existed. Do you not talk about leaving a mark on humanity? There won't be any, you won't even have a birth certificate left. You're out of here. You're gone. You never happened. Okay. If you don't make it. Well, how can I, how can I further uh, document that? Well, it's, it's real easy. It's right here in the Bible. All right? If, if we just pay attention to it. 
Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 on the Lord's Day. We're going to wind this up real quickly here now. Stick with me. I'm going to race along. Revelation chapter 20. And you know that we're in the millennium here. There are no more flesh bodies when chapter 20 is written. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pick it up in verse 10 where the Lord's day is over. It's time for the judgment that I've been leading up to all this time. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. That simply is world systems that he's able to use today. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I mean, that means a long time. Now, for I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, for who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. We moved into the final age here just about. Twelve. And I saw the dead. That means the spiritually dead. Deader than a hammer. Okay. Small and great stand before God, and the books were open. Oh, it's written, friend. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those books which were written in what was which were written in the books according to their works. Not faith, not belief, works. Why? They're already in spiritual bodies in the millennium. And they will have been taught, as verse five signifies in six of this particular chapter. Different subject, different time. 13. And the sea. What, what is the sea in Revelation? The last two verse, three verses of the 17th chapter let you know it's the peoples of the world. Okay. The mass of the people gave up the dead which were in it. That's to say those that didn't make it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Two times for emphasis. Bear in mind, this is not from your flesh judging. This is from the millennium judging. All right, The great white throne judgment. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoa, how many are there? Well, it's real simple. There's the death of the flesh. That's one. And there's the death of the soul. That's two. You don't have to fear those that can kill the flesh, but you better fear him if you're on the wrong side who can do both, all right? 15, and whosoever shall not, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, period. Boom, just like that. And that's the second death. Well, let me ask you a question. What does death mean? If your soul dies, what does that mean? Forever and ever it's going to burn? No, that's not the meaning of death. The death of a soul means it doesn't exist. Skip to the 8th verse of chapter 21. You're already in the eternity here. But the fearful, I mean, we've rejuvenated this earth. We got it heaven right here on earth. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. To go into that lake is the second death, meaning death of the soul. And to be, if you continued on into chapter 22, blotted out, period. Fini. So there you have hell fire, is the lake of fire, at, at the very end of the uh, millennium. Who was the first one that went into that lake other than his systems? In closing, I keep saying that, don't I? I got I to gotta go one more place to Ezekiel to put the frosting on this cake. Ezekiel 28. And I've got two verses and we're out of here. Who was the first one that went into the lake of fire other than his world systems? The one worldism and his office as the false messiah. That went in before the millennium. Satan was the first one in there. He wasn't even there through the judgment. Did you notice that? Satan wasn't around when the great white throne judgment took place. He was already in the lake. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why was that? I thought God was fair because he had been judged a long time ago. Listen to it. 
the king of Tyre, which Tyre in the Hebrew tongue means rock, not our rock. This is Satan's office before his fall. When he fell, this happened. Verses 18 and 19 of Ezekiel 28. Thus hast, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, but the iniquity of thy, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee. What's it going to do to Satan? It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes. Ashes are fini, final. Upon the earth in the sight of all them that beheld thee. In other words, people are going to see that even before the great white throne judgment. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Well, I, I thought he was going to burn forever and ever. Never will thou be any more. We serve a God that loves his children. He doesn't want to zap some of them, but he's got to. Why? So the rest of you can have peace after it's all said and done. The blotting out. And I'm just going, I want you to make a note for those of you that have companion Bibles. There is an acrostic in the Hebrew manuscripts that tell you exactly what happened to those that uh, it seems like they always get ahead when they're evil as to how they will, I will just give you the three verses that set out in the acrostic from Psalms 37. That why, why is it that the evil always seem to be blessed? It said just stick around a while. They're going to be like the fat of a lamb when it's on a spit. Do you know what the fat of the lamb does? It drops down into the fire on the hot coals. And it will ascend as smoke forever. And the third part of it is you're going to be there to see it. And you will because Satan goes into that fire first. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your precious word. Thank you for being with us. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen.